Hello, everyone. Welcome to Queerly Recommended, the podcast where we recommend queer films, books, TV shows, and more. I'm Chris Bryant, a contemporary romance writer for Bold Strokes Books, and this week I'm recommending a Netflix series. And I'm Tara Scott. I review sapphic fiction at the Lesbian Review and Smart Bitches Trashy Books, and this week I'm recommending a comedy special also on Netflix. As always, just want to take a minute to say thank you. Thank you to the folks that support the show through coffee, through our newsletter. We have links to both in the show notes. A special thank thanks. You. You're going to know who you are to the person who contributed recently. You sent a couple of lovely notes. We so appreciate your support. You are the best. Super sweet. All right, Chris, you're mm-hmm. drinking tonight. I am drinking. We are recording on a Tuesday night, which is highly unusual yeah so yeah so we'll have to get into why we're recording on a tuesday but i am drinking what's called lemonade and lavender it is a vodka drink with natural flavors it is the gayest name it is for a and drink it's, <laughs> right. in a while. and it's got pretty purple and yellow can and it's 5.5 percent alcohol so we're gonna see if that changes the tone of the conversation and all that the night might. goes on. It's been a while <laughs> since we've recorded anything with you drinking. Oh, no. Probably since your um what did you what do we call it? It was like drunk lesbic for oh, your Patreon. That's true. Right. We did, yeah, we've done a couple of those. Yeah, those were yes. pretty um and I do not hold back. No. When it's when <laughs> when we when that is the title of it, I am all in, and I still have to laugh about the one with Ray Spangler and how I have the fan. Like I came across that in my computer. Yes. That was just what was I thinking? Well, for me, it was that you were drinking and also wearing a velvet coat, so you were getting hot, and as you drank, you were getting hotter. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's true, but I was in character because we were talking yes. about I think modern English. So, yeah, yeah, I think that was the. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was I one of their English books that had yeah. recently re- released, and then the other one was with Tegan Shepherd. So, if you're not already on Chris's Patreon, <laughs> you might want to sign up even just to check that out because it's pretty I hilarious. It is fun. Yeah, I, I heard you have a book uh, that's nearly done. <laughs> I cannot, for the life of me, find the ending of this book, and it is due on Thursday at midnight. And I'm just sitting there. I have like two paragraphs maybe to write plus the epilogue and I can't get there. I can't get there. I've written so many words today alone that maybe I'm just kind of like, like I just probably need to take a step back and wait and maybe try it again tomorrow. night. I mean, what are my options? I have two days. I got to figure out. I got to come up put, with it. You can put chat GPT through its pace. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. No. <laughs> no so yeah so i am struggling with the ending but i tell you it's right there it's right there and i i trust myself i know that i will come up with it you will but it's not there yet i mean you've done it happen. like more than 20 <laughs> times before so i have That's all true. the so faith i trust myself <laughs> yes i mean yes. People don't know. I gave you a solution. I don't think anybody would like it. No, everybody would be very <laughs> upset with you. Very. My idea, and it would just end it. So it would be four words. You don't even need two paragraphs. I just said, and then you just say, and they all die. But See. you know what? Chris is a better person than me. So you're all going to actually get an ending. That is not in the arc. I mean, that's not <laughs> in the arc, the romantic arc that it doesn't really follow the rules. So Ugh. I'm not going to go with that. But could you imagine just like <laughs> your fans? <clears throat> oh my god, lesbian fans would be livid. If they would be very mad. Like that. <laughs> I would lose people. I would lose people. They would be so mad at me. Plus, I don't think my editor would actually let me get through or get away with that. You could Probably try not. like once and then like you go to the next page and then it's the JK here's the actual ending. <laughs> You know, that's a good idea, but uh, I don't know. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. Hmm. We'll see. And you have exciting plans. So, uh, and you don't know this person, so I'm kind of excited to tell you and to get your reaction. I am actually going to see John Edward. And I know, here's, 
Yeah. So we were, we were going over the outline for this and you said you're going to see John Edward and you're very excited. And I, was, and I had two thoughts at the exact same time. And the first was, I don't know who that is. And the second one was, but I know you have talked about him before. I just don't remember <laughs> who he is. Yes. He is a psychic medium. Right. That yes. one. I always yes. think the politician is the problem. Well, that's the plural Edwards. Yeah. See? So that's the, but John Edward is the medium. Right. So. Yeah. So it was, it was really interesting. Uh, after my mother passed, my sister said, Hey, if you ever, if John Edward ever comes into town or another medium, we have to get tickets. And so one of my friends sent me a message saying that he was going to be, or he's going to be in town in September, which is quite a long way away, but I'm like, okay, we're doing this. So we're going to do it. Oh, well, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. How many times I'm do you excited. think you've been to see him? Uh, I've only been once before. That was okay. really emotional. Uh, and I think like this time will be exceedingly emotional and I'll be crying the whole time for other people because it's very, mm -hmm. you know, it's, I don't know. It's just, it's something to experience for sure. I've never been to one before. It might be kind of cool now. I would have been terrified probably for a long time because that would have been, you know, like growing up in the church, it all would have been like that, you know, that's right. satanic. That. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, right. yeah, that's from the devil. You might as well play D&D. &D. <laughs> it's like, well, I like that now. <laughs> I like D&D, &D, so maybe I would like going to see medium. I don't know. Right. <laughs> and, and it's cool because what I really appreciated about seeing him is that, you know, they always have these jokes and these little skits like on Saturday Night Live and different places where they make fun of mediums mm -hmm. and going there he's just up there on stage with a chair and he'll say okay you know this person's really loud they're coming through and blah 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 and then somebody will say oh I think that's my dad and he says like a couple of things he's like no and he like he dismisses them but it's very like it's very curt but mm. because the, the person who is channeling through really you know, only has, a, I don't know, a certain amount of time or whatever. It's just like, no, that's not, that's, he's, he wants to get to the person he needs to mm -hmm. get to instead of, you know, like drawing it out. He's like very, very quick. So that's interesting. It really is. So it goes super fast. So it's not like, oh my gosh, we're going to spend 15 minutes or 30 minutes on this person, but that's mm -hmm. not how it goes. Okay. I know. Well, so I'm very excited. That happens in September. So check back in October when mm -hmm. I have, you know, I can tell you my story. Yeah. Okay. I'm excited. I can't wait. Good. Me too. <laughs> now you so have the news. Reason, so the reason <laughs> we're recording on a Tuesday is that we couldn't record on Monday. And I can't remember why we wanted to do it on Monday instead of Sunday like we usually do. Because oh, right. Memorial Day. Because Memorial Day. Which for all the folks outside of the U.S. that might not know is a U.S. holiday. And so it was like, yeah, no problem. We'll do it uh, Monday, Monday evening. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> as the day went on, I realized I was getting progressively angrier and angrier because we had an election in my province, which for the American folks is like a state. Uh, we were basically trying to figure out if all of our local representatives at the uh, provincial level, as well as the head of the whole province, we have a, we, we, had a libertarian in charge of the province and we had a chance to go with kind of a more left-leaning some people would talk about her as though she's like the farthest left in the whole wide world and I promise she's not like she's <laughs> so so middle of the road like mm -hmm. she still supports the oil and gas industry in Alberta which you have to if you want to be the person leading the province and I, it's like, all I wanted was just, can we please get her? That would be nice. Um, and unfortunately, the libertarian is still in charge of the province after yesterday. Mm. Uh, so that sucks. Uh, this person compared vaccinated people to Nazis. Oh my uh, gosh. Yeah. She, it's just like which stupid factoids even it's so hard to know which you know what i'm not going to let's not dwell on that there's going to be four years of hearing all about it but the part that i take joy in and i think is the reason why i had like a really great mood all day because you would think given that it went the way that i didn't want it to 
that I would be like angry and depressed right, right now. And I right. anticipated it too. I knew it was a risk saying, can we push it to tomorrow? Like if I just was like the world is over kind of mood, I probably would have suggested we rerun one of our early episodes <laughs> or something. But two magical things happened. Mm-hmm. And the first was that, okay, so the NDP did not end up being the party in power, but they did gain 10 seats, which I feel oh. like is still a huge deal. It is. Um, given the way this province goes. And the other one, much more specifically to me, is that where I live, we flipped our representative. <laughs> and I'm like, fuck yes, because I yeah. didn't like the person that we had. She had been in, I think she had done two terms and like I would try to write to her about issues and I would either get nothing or I would get the most bullshit form, wow. like please fuck off kind of letter ever. And I am so excited that we got somebody else in and now I'm starting to think I mean I need to I need to do some serious thinking about what kind of time commitments I can make but like I actually wonder if I should try and see if I can volunteer oh because that's a there's, good idea yeah right like it's similar to when you went to that protest and realizing that <laughs> Yeah, you know what? The world is scary and it feels easier to like stay at home and protect ourselves and withdraw. But I don't think it's the time for that. It's how do we find the ways that are right for us to stay and fight where we are? And I think that might be one of them. And for some reason, like, I love this podcast. That's why we do it. But I think it all of a sudden, again, kind of reinforced part of for me, why I love doing this podcast is it's kind of another way of fighting for our position in the world. We're putting mm-hmm. our voice out there. We're putting the media out there while also hopefully people are connecting with their next favorite book or film or a TV show or whatever it is, because I don't want us to have to go back into any kind of closets. Right. And so let's all take joy in representation and talk loudly about it as much as possible on as big a platform we have as possible. So I don't know. It could have been a lot better. Could have been a lot worse. (laughs) (laughs) Um, And now I feel like I'm just trying to figure out like, yeah, how do I want to do more without running for office because every so often somebody be like you should run for your for office I'm you like, should mm, I don't you should listen to. to Jonathan you should listen to Jonathan you should <laughs> run for office oh gosh well then I'd have to give up writing and probably my day job and probably eBay and definitely mm-hmm. probably the podcast and my Patreon so I got a That's lot it. so I got a lot so it would be hard to run especially since it's- yeah, I don't think it pays as much, does it? <laughs> I don't know. Almost certainly not in Canada. <laughs> well, for sure, the healthcare would be worth it because you get health care for life, I think. I don't know at what stage you get the health care for life. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you have to be a senator or representative or any sort of representative. I don't know. But I know mm-hmm. that whatever you get it for life and really it's okay. all about it's all about health care. So if someday you send me a text and you're like, sorry, I got to stop doing the podcast. I'm running for office. For office, then you know, yeah. I you know, we know have a, going for healthcare. We have a mayor, my our mayor here in Kansas City, uh, Quentin Lucas. Mm-hmm. I fight with him all the time on Twitter. Like, and, and he's he's very liberal. He's very, you know, he's a Democrat because, you know, I'm, I'm in a blue city mm-hmm. in a red state. So... Yeah. And I'm just like, you know, I could probably do a pretty good job too. Like, I feel like there's so literally there's so much politics and politics that being an outsider coming in, Mm -hmm. I feel like I could probably bring something different, especially being queer, but then also I could be bought. So, I mean, Jesus, I don't know. That's, that's a tough one. That is a problem. Yeah. I feel like I would be like that one politician. What state is he from Pennsylvania or something? The guy that shows up to things in hoodies and shorts and everybody <laughs> else is in the suits. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty much my whole wardrobe right there. So yeah. yeah. So we would show up like oh my God. <laughs> I will not wear hard pants to anything. Like I don't care. Hard no, it's track pants, it's shorts, maybe sweats in the winter, but I am not wearing hard pants to this job. 
Dude, I am in like Pepto Bismol pink sweatpants with a Golden yes. Girls t shirt on. So, like, <laughs> yeah. I am in shorts and a black shirt. It's funny. I was talking to my sister about, I was like, you know, I don't even have time to switch out my winter clothes and my summer clothes. No, I was mm-hmm. talking to my engineer about this. My sister, my engineer, they're all the same. Not really, but um, oh, sure. I've known Chris forever. And uh, he's like, so basically, you're putting away your black long sleeve t-shirts and hoodies for your black t-shirts short sleeve t-shirts I'm like exactly that's exactly what I need to do but I need the time to do it too Mm -hmm. so yeah oh that's funny it changes your wardrobe Mm -hmm. (laughs) pandemics they're good for wardrobe change yeah yeah my wardrobe got much softer (laughs) it did (laughs) (laughs) I'm not mad at it all right Chris what have you been reading or watching lately Okay, so I finished Jeopardy Masters. All right, and how was it? Who won? Are we happy? Okay, so start with listen. start with are we happy, or wherever that, you want. Really, that messed me up. Okay, I really? know. Like you wouldn't think so, right? Because it's a game show. Like, how could I be so emotional about a game a game show? Everybody knows that I watch Jeopardy every day. There's like daytime Jeopardy. I watch it every day. Mm-hmm. I have for years and years. Like yeah. back in the day, like I recorded it on VCR. I mean, that's how, that's how long I've been watching Jeopardy. And when James Holtzauer came along, he changed the game. And I have, I had mad respect for him for changing the game. So basically masters is six of the best okay. Jeopardy champions, six of the best competing for half a million dollars Mm -hmm. and out of the six i love five i love five i love five i love five of them so basically so i so we had james holtzauer in there and i was like i really love james i have for years Mm -hmm. and matea roach Mm -hmm. amy schneider i mean i've talked about all these people because they're very queer yeah um there's sam and andrew and the one person i didn't like was madame odio and it's funny because one of my friends went to high school with him and sent me a picture of the high school of the yearbook <laughs> picture. Of oh, him. no way. Totally creepy. Yeah. So I'm like, I don't like him because he was very like he never formed it in a question. He always said, what's Einstein? What's and there's always a pause while he's like filing it, you know, trying to find it in his brain what the answer is. But always what's Tara? What's Chris? It was never, you know, the right question mm-hmm. format and then he used to drive people crazy and he was just annoying very annoying and I was like please do not let him win let anybody else win but don't let Matt win so at the very final so the three final players James mm-hmm. Matea and Matt Amodio. I'm like ah. oh. so they asked them when the final jeopardy was like two games and then they add the points together and whoever had the highest amount of points won the 500,000 second place got 250,000 and third place got 150. But the winner had an additional, they were going to win an additional hundred thousand dollars to go to their charity of choice. Okay. And so like everybody talked about the charity and they got to Matt Amodio and he said, he really pushed the adopt don't shop for animals. And he's like, it doesn't cost you anything, you know, stop, you know, he's, he came down really hard on breeders, on dog breeders. And he just said, I was like, okay, Matt's my man. Like that (laughs) made me like, okay, he's in the top six now. So I like him because he had such passion for that. And you know, that's my thing too. So anyway, but I digress. So the tournament, you know, like I said, I love James, but then he just got to be so cocky and I hated that. Mm. And he tried to make it funny. But it came across as being like, you know, that awkward where things fall flat Mm -hmm. and it just fell flat. And I was so embarrassed for him. And I was like, I can't believe that I pushed for him for so long. But again, he's very, very smart. And he changed the way Jeopardy's played. Because back in the day for like however many years, 30, 40 years, everybody would go down the the categories in order, 200, Mm -hmm. 400, 600. And he switched it. He went to the very bottom every single time. Like that's how he won because it like threw everybody off their game. Mm. So, and the the idea with the categories is you start small and you kind of like get a feel for what the category is going to be like. And then, you know, you understand it, but you know, the the questions get harder as you go, but he started at the bottom, like the hundred, the hundred, I'm sorry, the thousand dollar questions, $2,000 question. That's how he started. And it just messed up everybody. 
So now people are cha- people have started playing like he plays. Mm-hmm. And that is amazing. Okay, so the spoiler alert is that James did win. He won the 500,000. But Matea, she came in second. And the reason why I was so emotional about this is because during this tournament, their father passed away. Hmm. Yeah. And so, you know, they were really struggling and I didn't think that they were going to place like at the very end. It just so happened that they answered more questions correctly than the person that they tied with. So they got to move on to the finals. So, but it was very, it was just so heartfelt watching everybody surround them and just like, like lift them up. And I I just, I love that so much. It It just felt like such a good it was, it was a good vibe. The whole Jeopardy Mm -hmm. Masters was a good vibe. It wasn't, it was a competition, but it really wasn't, it didn't feel like a competition. It felt more like, like a friendly game where people were like, you know, your family members are all hanging out, ask, you know, playing Trivial Pursuit or something. Yeah. So, so that actually was amazing. And it, it it took place over several weeks. It was like, like two games, two days a week for like three or four weeks until they got to the finals. So, so I watched that and wow, that was a whirlwind. That, yeah, that was that whole thing. Cause that was like an hour every night. You know, I watched daytime Jeopardy and then there was the hour Jeopardy at night in the masters at mm. night. And let me tell you, those questions were stupid hard. <laughs> it's like one of, and they're like so fast. I'm like, if I could yeah. get one in before they did, I was like, yes, I'm amazing. Yeah. But that didn't happen very often. I am also in the middle of watching the ultimatum queer love and it's absolutely awful. And um, it is trash. <laughs> it is. I Yay. was like, we deserve <laughs> trash too. Yeah. It shouldn't just be for the straights. <laughs> I know. Let me tell you, it is trash. And here's the thing. And it's like all the, the, the contestants, you know, the whole concept is you give your partner of X amount of years, the ultimatum, either marry me or piss off. That's basically how it is. Uh, so they yeah, that always night. works. In real life. (laughs) So let's make a TV show of it. Okay. (laughs) So, and I watched the whole straight version of it too. So then I was like, when it was queer, I was like, oh yeah, this is going to be the best thing ever. Like, this is what we want. Mm -hmm. And and Mm -hmm. no, it was just awful. And like, there's this person on there. Her name is Vanessa. Mm -hmm. And I, she's horrible. And I'm like, how could this, this sweet little Xander is, is, was dating so basically what happens is they have one last night together and then they break up and then they have to find they date like everybody within the circle they all date one another until they find somebody they match with and so then they live with them for three weeks and then at the end of it it's like a fake marriage and at the end of it they have to decide if they want to stay with them or go back to their their original partner like whoever gave the ultimatum or whatever so it is trash. And I just, this so. Vanessa person is just like awful. And I'm just like, how did sweet little Xander have to deal with this for so long? It's just trash. Anyway, so this sounds of like course- the stupidest. <laughs> I actually, I had a friend from my last job text and I like, I missed her text. So today I was like scrolling through and I was like, oh, okay. And, and I looked and I was like, oh shit. Huh. Yeah. Cause she wanted to know if I'd watched it. Cause she has thoughts and wants to talk about it. I was like, oh, I have to, I mean- do I even, and am I even a co-host on Queerly Recommended if I don't watch right. this show? So you have to watch this for just I because will. it's queer love. That's what it's, it's called. Queer love. It's queer something. It's queer something. So we got to watch it. <laughs> so I'm going to finish it because it is love. And I do have hope that like, yeah. hopefully Xander or other people get, uh, um, therapy, find love and therapy, oh. right? <laughs> okay. Love and therapy. Oh my God. That's a great, that's what we should. That is a great show title. Mm-hmm love and therapy i like it Mm -hmm. um yeah so i'll probably finish it i think it's i think i'm caught up it's like a they dropped like four episodes and then they're gonna drop another four i think it's one of those deals so i stayed up though and i watched the four episodes i'm like oh my god this is long so i stayed up way past my bedtime and i had to watch it and and i was just like i just ruined valuable writing time (laughs) watching this trash and the other thing survivor ended Mm -hmm. the survivor 44 ended and a queer man won jam jam won way to go queer guy hey queer guy jam jam i did not want him to win i was kind of hoping that other people i never pick the winners i always pick the sweet people who i think are just like i would be friends with them yeah i think they're genuine people but they always like like the people who are cutthroat and like 
are just awful. Uh, they play the game. They stab everybody in the back. They win. And then yeah. they're rewarded by really shitty behavior. Here's a million dollars because, you know, so anyway. Yeah. And I just found out. So one of the contestants was struggled with, I'm not quite sure. I'm not even going to guess, but she had issues. And Asia, the singer Sia, mm-hmm. gives a like love survivor and gives uh, the like the f- her three of her favorite contestants gives mm-hmm. them money for playing on the show and gave what? Yes, I did not know this, and so I had to Google it because yeah, Evan told said something about it, and I'm just like what? And so I looked, and so this woman got a hundred thousand dollars, even though she what? didn't win. Yes. So Sia gave her a hundred thousand dollars just because she really liked her and her story. And I think that's Holy great. Shit. Is it right. almost like a, I think you were wonderful. And the person who won is a douche nozzle. Right. I would like to write a universal wrong. And so right. I'm going to give you some of my famous rich person money. I think Good so. Good for Sia. Right. And you know what? This all started way back when there was a character named Rupert and he did not win, but every single person who watched the show loved him. There wasn't mm-hmm. a single person who disliked him. He was just so genuine and he was fun and he loved the game. And out of nowhere, Survivor's like, oh, by the way, we have a million dollar fan favorite. So the winner got a million dollars plus then Rupert got a million dollars. Yeah, Whoa. as fan favorite. But honestly, I don't know. They stopped that quickly because I don't know of any other, I mean, I'm not thinking hard enough. They probably but, don't have $2 million. <laughs> I'm sure they do. Yeah. But yeah, so that is a lot. And that is what I've been watching. And that's all Whoa. I can do is watch. So what about you? What have you been watching, reading? Yes. Enjoying? So I continue on the Drag Race All-Stars season eight. So what's interesting is the way you said that about the fan favorite, they've actually introduced a fan favorite type thing this season there's always some kind of a twist with all stars and some of them they continue on in future seasons so no longer a twist sometimes they introduce new ones uh one that they introduced a few seasons ago was the idea of a lipstick assassin so what's different with all stars versus the main drag race seasons is main drag race seasons the two bottom queens have to lip sync for their life which is awesome and it's awesome for like a variety of reasons often you see like super iconic things happen but also there's this chance to like no I'm gonna really show you what I can do and it's cool but what they did in all stars as of a few seasons ago is they said it's like a different elimination model I guess is the thing like somebody isn't eliminated at the end that way instead it's like the queens all have a chance to decide who's eliminated and they vote by choosing lipsticks and oh. but what they're doing now is the winner for that day gets to maybe decide who's going to be home, going home but it depends on whether they win in a lip sync against some past queen who has been on the show at any point in history of it wow. which there's like a buttload of yeah. seasons <laughs> i don't know how many i think there's there's got to be oh yeah there's over 20 at this point between all stars and regular season So they'll have the group all vote. And if the assassin wins, it's the group vote that decides who's going home of the Mm. bottom two queens. If the winning queen for that day wins, it's whoever she chose that gets to go home. So it's kind of cool. But (laughs) now this season, if you are eliminated, because whoever wins the season wins, I think it's $200,000. But all the queens who have been eliminated have a chance to win $50,000 because they're doing this thing called the Fame Games so that it's on Untucked, which is like the spinoff show Mm -hmm. of like the behind the scenes or whatever, and on Instagram and probably other social media channels, they're letting the eliminated queens showcase their runway looks. And then whoever is the fan favorite based on all the runway looks they show will win this $50,000. And I thought it was really, really cool idea because so many of them will spend thousands and thousands of dollars on costumes. And if you go home, say there's like, say it's a short season and there's 10 episodes and you go home on episode two, how many thousands of dollars did you spend on looks that you don't actually even get to show on the show? So I think that is pretty awesome. Otherwise though, like 
it's a weird season. Like I'm enjoying it, Mm -hmm. but I thought there would be like more storylines happening or something. I don't know. It's really weird. The drama that I was hoping for didn't really pan out. Unfortunately, Mrs. Kasha Davis went home. She was the one I was kind of rooting for who was in the documentary that I talked about. She went home on episode three. Mm -hmm. So there's, there are good moments. The it's, I'm having a hard time kind of deciding who I want to have win. Cause there's two in particular that I think are quite exciting. One of them is Jessica Wilde who hasn't been on a drag race season since season two. Wow. So it's been, I can't remember if it was 13 or 15 years. <laughs> and so getting to see Queens from like that early comeback is always so cool. Cause it kind of like reignites their career all over again. And then the other queen is one named Jimbo, who was on UK versus the world, but who was also on the first season of Canada's Drag Race. So we actually have a Canadian queen in this season. Nice. And I kind of, I kind of want my country's rep to win. Oh, yeah. Why not? I mean, she's not there as a representative of Canada, but you know, that's kind of how Canadians are. We're right. like, holy shit, a Canadian on an American show. <laughs> that's her person. <laughs> We want them to win. So that's the, that's my every Friday night. I feel like the rhythm of my week is back now that I have a drag race to watch on Friday night. I know what day of the week it is again. <laughs> Last week, Neil and our oldest kid went on a trip abroad, which means that for a week, it was me and the youngest kid hanging out at home. And the and dog. And some of like trying to figure out, and the dog, yeah, okay, the dog was here. <laughs> she was here she's lucky she's no I'm kidding (laughs) um man that dog has so much energy it sometimes feels like it's impossible to find the bottom of that well (laughs) we survived but one of the things that I wanted to do is figure out like okay what are some things that this kid and I are going to do where it's just the two of us for a week and I thought let's show her some of those like iconic tween movies and some were bust and some worked out well. Freaky Friday, I thought would be, and like the Jamie Lee Curtis, Lindsay Lohan, oh, okay. Freaky Friday. That one. Okay. Mm-hmm. I thought she'd love it. Uh, nope. I think Trash. we made it 15 minutes. She was like, no, nah, I don't want to nope. watch this. And I said, hang on. <laughs> and then I put on Mean Girls and she loved it. Wow. <laughs> Absolutely loved it. And the thing that I, I was a little nervous going into it because I know they use the word slut a lot and they did. And we talked about that though. And good. it was so good. And I think like, yeah, there are some things that don't hold up, but for the most part, I actually think it holds up the message, especially holds up so right. well around that whole, like, why do we tear each other down? Why do we call each other sluts and whores and bitches and all these things? Like, I really like, it's great. I was really happy with that. And then we watched The Princess Diaries, which again, she was kind of skeptical going into it. And I was like, no, 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 no. Trust me. I (laughs) promise. And she loved it because of course, Mia Thermopolis is the best. And that one, oh, Chris, it's so good. It is still so good. I was shocked at how good it still is. And then the finale, this one actually was funny because I started and she was like, I don't want to watch that at all. And it was Sister Act. And I was like, well, I don't care. I'm going to watch it. <laughs> but she's sitting there in the same room and she's on the iPad. And she didn't really say anything until it got to, you know, the first song when the nuns are singing and it's like horrifically bad. Yeah. But they're singing so badly. And I just hear this little, they're awful. And I said, yeah, I know they're supposed to be. My favorite part about that was that when they were singing so badly, the dog was so concerned she like ran up to the tv and she's trying to check it out because the noise is are they okay yeah (laughs) oh that's sweet but when they started to sing well Mm -hmm. i heard this little oh they're pretty good and then as they continued to be good she was like i'm putting my ipad away i'm just watching this with you and she (laughs) loved it sister act honestly like it holds up. It is so Love good, it. even to today. Because Neil has this phrase that I think is so true and works so well, which is that comedy ages like milk, which is really true. Mm-hmm. I think when comedy is grounded, like very specifically grounded in whatever that time is. But Sister Act's humor, I think, is just like it's more universal. 
and it's gonna it's probably still gonna be good in another 30 40 years so i had the soundtrack i love the movie i mean i will watch it every time it's on yeah i do it for singing (laughs) i mean what's not to love (laughs) it's just it's all right there and then the other thing I was watching, cause I decided I just needed like another chill, you know me, like I love my gentle reality cooking shows right. where you continue with the same contestants all the way through. I've never seen the final table. It's on Netflix. It's pretty cool. Hmm. Um, it's pairs of chefs. I suspect at some point they're going to be split apart. And it's, it's all these chefs that are like from different countries. Some have worked together before some haven't worked together before, but it's, and they're each episode, they're cooking the cuisine of a different country which is kind of cool and so they'll bring in like local celebrities from each country so for the american one it was like colin hanks dax shepherd and then there's a food Mm -hmm. critic so they'll have a food critic there and so that's the first round is being judged by these people and then the bottom three have to cook again and they cook for a famous chef from Mm -hmm. whatever country it is there are definitely gay people on this show nice and i would like to give an extra special shout out to ash who is this like super hot queer well now i gotta I google think identifies as a woman i hope so see did on the show at the time uh mm-hmm. who is from south africa oh yeah look up uh look up ash the final, final table. table okay ash Valenzuela, yeah. heger heger all right yeah. I, haven't, I haven't seen any pictures oh yeah right yeah oh yeah just like that gorgeous big dyke energy do we say that is that a thing we say we can we can say it where we want right i hope so but definitely yeah look at the tats oh right right that's it just the like <laughs> the, the that... good the energy the like confident like that yes screams yes yeah yeah it's really fun so I think for people who are saying well what do I watch after you know next in fashion and the big brunch and queer eye and great British bake-off like you just need something this would be a great option Hmm. yeah because everything's ending you know because the summer starts and when the summer starts all the shows end because Mm -hmm. nobody's home they're all out like at the lake it's summer vacation yeah so they shut down all the the normal shows so that's when i hit netflix hard so that is something i will definitely be watching so yay yeah i don't think it i don't even think it's a new show it might even be like from shortly before the pandemic yeah um and it's just the one season so it's pretty easy to get through all of it but i just i really enjoy it i'm not done yet but i'm pretty excited to see how it ends nice so chris yes what is your official recommendation this week okay so my official recommendation is queer eye season seven which takes place in new orleans so if you if you don't know the show or what it's about like who hurt you i mean everybody knows (laughs) queer eye everybody knows that so five celebrity queers aka the fab five bobby jonathan finesse trying to think of everybody anthony Um, caramo anthony caramo tan so they all bring something different to help improve a person's life so somebody is nominated by family or friends and then the fab five they go in and try to help them improve whether it's their look their self-confidence uh where they live how they eat so and just you know how they fix things and work and and just just a better feel for themselves I, I think that's a good way to say it. Yeah. So I really love it. it I love the transformations. It's very positive. It's a very positive show. And it's, mm-hmm. it is emotional. Yes, it's emotional, but it's good emotional. Yes. You know, I think I cried in every episode, but good tears, good tears. I mean, I cry at everything. So it really depends on the season for me. I feel like I like, I don't mm-hmm. think I cried as much this season, but there are oh, other really? seasons mm-hmm. that have fucking ruined me. Mm-hmm. Well, I think there were some seasons where they were in areas where it was people that like, you know, they had more, more religious backgrounds mm-hmm. and that whole, like, I'm, well, there was a little bit of that here, not like the religion part specifically, but like, I'm not comfortable being a queer person in mm-hmm. this town. And 
or there can be like various family things. It just, it really de- depends. I also think maybe I watched this season with like a little too much cannabis. Okay. So <laughs> there are, there are times where it can like enhance the feelings and there are times where it can like not enhance the feelings. I think it was one of those not enhancing mm. times. It was a good season, I thought. It was, yeah. It was. It's a short season. It's only seven episodes. I, I binged yeah. it in a weekend, so it's not. It doesn't take up a lot of time. I, you know, we talked about last podcast a little bit that we were both kind of starting it. I was like, oh, I'm already on episode four, or whatever. Mm-hmm. And so the first episode, if you can get through the first episode, then the rest is is great. That first episode was like, Are you <laughs> kidding me. So I mean, it takes place at a frat house like Mm -hmm. lambda chi alpha and i have to know from people who are listening Mm -hmm. when people first move out of their house do they go through a transformation where they become total pigs and then magically when they get their own apartments yeah and after college they grow up and start taking care of things i mean i need to know i mean will they always be gross will they always be awful i i I, i'm it just shocked me that people lived that yeah. way like that smart was not good. dudes live this way they basically um, lived in the fight clubhouse i uh, oh I mean, it was just nasty yeah. every single room was nasty like somebody stayed in a room where they never changed the litter box i feel so sorry for that cat i want that cat to come live here because mm-hmm. you know those boys i say boys those frat kids were not i mean like it wasn't they even good. showed they even showed the litter box it was horrible it and bugs right. everywhere and like like did they ever wash their clothes i don't think they did Ooh. yeah so Ooh. that first one for sure was the worst episode i was like eh, i don't know if i'm gonna get through this like i i don't know but mm-hmm. i i went through and uh oh oh so here's something i thought about too while i was watching this the episode so do you remember the show like Extreme Home Makeover with Ty Pennington? Do you remember yes. that show? Okay. Yes, I do. So they actually came into Kansas City and redid a house that is near my office. Really? So every so often when I go to do some shopping, like on my lunch hour, I'm like, oh, that's right. There's that house over here. I want to see what it looks like. Mm-hmm. So like I found it, it was one, you know, they don't ever tell you where it is, but you just kind of know it's over in this area. So I just yeah. drove around till I saw this like gingerbread, beautiful house in this, you know, whatever neighborhood. So I did find it. And so I, I always knew where it was. So I'd always go visit it. Like if this happened was like, what, when did it was like 20 years ago, maybe when yeah, it was Extreme a, Home Makeover was around. Yes. Cause it was both. It was when I was still living. I think it was when I was still living with my parents. So I think I was in university yeah. maybe yeah yeah so it did it did not age well i mean it's all about location so they have this massive huge house and of course it looks way bigger like Mm -hmm. on tv than it does in real life and like the houses next to it are just like kind of trashy sounds bad to say but they're not it's not a neighborhood that that has like a hoa or that like yeah cares about like hey i haven't mowed the grass in four months it's okay Mm -hmm. we don't care because we don't have any rules so it's that kind of neighborhood. Mm-hmm. So uh, I went there, I drove by it probably like last year and I was very disappointed, but you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. So I hope that this doesn't happen to, I hope this frat house, that doesn't happen to the frat house. I'd oh, like, I'd like yeah. them to do it like three months later and go check to see like, yeah. how, how it is now. It's like, can they, it would be hard to tell because it was, that's, that's the one thing I think with Queer Eyes, like they never do the external of the house. Like, right just the internal. extreme home right. makeover they'll do the whole like right they'll the, build a house in they, three days they got it they rip everything right. from the outside <laughs> they redo everything right so but yeah i felt the same way too because it looked it looked rich when they yes. were done and with I'm that like, frat house they're gonna pawn this stuff and why give the kids white furniture white pillows what are you crazy yeah like, the white part didn't make sense it's right. like i mean maybe they won't on this stuff but also they very clearly partied a lot <laughs> in that house like right. you saw all the beer cans right. all the pizza boxes i'm sure there were like bongs and shit that they had to clear out of the way before they could even fill right. just to maintain their rating 
Like if you had told me there were condoms right. on that floor, I would not have been surprised. Yeah. Yeah. So if you can get past that episode, then it just, then it's just great. Like the second mm-hmm. episode, I think that was probably my favorite because Stephanie, um, she's a lesbian in New Orleans oh, and yes. she's like the super fan. Like she has all this memorabilia everywhere uh, for the saints. And I think other uh, sports teams, mm-hmm. but I was of course zoning in on the NFL stuff. So, yeah. um, so I know that she like has jerseys and signed footballs and all this good stuff. And the thing that I loved about this episode is how she transformed, how she went from like self-doubt and she kind of felt shameful about being mm-hmm. a lesbian. And she was embarrassed if her dad's friends wanted to know anything about her because she was, she didn't want to embarrass her dad by telling the world that she was a lesbian. Mm-hmm. And so I loved that once they, once she realized what she was doing, because not everybody realizes that. Yeah. And so once she realized that that is what she was doing, just seeing how she handled it and how they said, you're worthy, you know, you are a beautiful person. You have a right to everything like everybody else does. And then like the, the physical transformation, I absolutely love that. They like oh. cut her hair and made it blonde. It just, it was beautiful. I just, so good. it was so good. It was such, it was just such a, that was a feel good episode for me that I, I cried on that episode for sure. Yeah. I really loved that one. Mm -hmm. I was talking to another friend about it. It was funny. They were talking about the hair and they said they were actually a little disappointed. And I said, why? What? Um, So they felt like it stopped one step too soon. What if she ended up with hair that's like a light peach or pink or a lilac or something like that? And I was like, oh, she could with her skin. She could absolutely rock that. But I still thought she looked incredible. Oh, I did too. I kind of wondered, which kind of put me on a thought about Queer Eye in general, because the way they were talking about, yeah, so like she just kind of very much shut down and she talks a little bit about she had some kind of a negative reaction in or she like somebody had a negative reaction to her in public it sounds like some kind of like a homophobic like she she experienced some pretty public homophobia and then she also got some after she was named like super fan of the year or whatever by her team but the way that one in public experience really impacted her kind of made me wonder if she might have ADHD or something like that because rejection sensitive dysphoria can be a part of of mm-hmm. uh being a person who's neurodiverse which then sort of took me down the like the one thing that I don't know that I've ever seen on queer eye although I have a bad memory so <laughs> you maybe both. they did <laughs> and maybe I just don't remember but I feel like I don't see them addressing the concept of executive dysfunction very much which is a thing that is a big deal for people with ADHD and autism and like any kind of neurodiversity really, where it's like, you want to do things. It's not that you want to live with your shit all over the house or that you want to not eat healthy meals, but like you're literally fighting your brain all the time Mm -hmm. to just do the things that you need to do. I've had that happen before. It's like, yep. Then I'm going to get up and I'm going to go do this. And it's like that constant repeating to myself. Yeah. And I'm going to go do it. And it's like, Mm -hmm. How do you make that connection? Well, it turns out medication. That's been wonderful. (laughs) But like for some of the people on this show, quite similar to, I think we talked about it probably the first year we started doing the podcast. We've talked about Queer Eye kind of every Mm -hmm. year as the season comes out. But do you remember us talking about in their early seasons how some of their suggestions, it's like, cool, but you're making the suggestion to somebody who has no money. Right. Like, right. like Jonathan Van Ness saying like, here, go to this like super nice haircutting place. And it's like, these people <laughs> live in a fucking trailer and they both right. work in Walmart and $300 there's nothing wrong. For right. a haircut. Like, there's n- no. <laughs> exactly. Nothing wrong with living in a trailer, nothing wrong with working at a Walmart, but there is something wrong with saying, do these things that cost more right. money than you bring than in. You and have. I guess right. I just wondered, is there, I think they've gotten a little better, hopefully with the economic suggestions, but also I just wonder if there's something there too, about like, mm-hmm. Yes, address the inner child stuff, heal all of that. But if somebody is having executive dysfunction, how can you help them with that? Are there any tips? Like, is there anything Karamo could be doing to help them? Well, I think as a representative for Canada, I think you should use your power and reach out since also your BFFs with Jonathan. 
Oh, you sure. should you should bring that up. Like you should like write the show and say, hey, come on, jerks, make it happen. <laughs> no. uh, hey, Bessie, could you right. perhaps consider Address this or, you know, mm-hmm. find out because that is a that is a thing and yeah. it does need to be addressed. So I don't know. I think you should. And you're so eloquent when you write. You know, I write smutty trash and romance and you write like like important things and smart stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, you write whole ass books and then <laughs> I write critiques of whole ass books, but sure. Yeah, but you, but. but you like, you're so good with words and I just like put them together and then they kissed and they liked each other. And do you like me? I like you. Those are my maybe, words. Maybe I will try to write to the producers. I think you should. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. So, um, basically that's my recommendation. So I think that it's both lighthearted and heavy hearted and yeah. it has fabulous queer content and I, it's just kind of a feel better about the world and queerness in general when you watch the show. Yeah. So, I think yeah. it's one that I tend to think of like in my head, queer eye and we're here are like right next to right. each other on the shelf in my head. And I think that although I cannot adequately express how grateful I am for the work we're here has done in documenting the, the worsening shifts in sentiment towards LGBTQ people and drag Queens. I was kind of relieved that queer. I was like, yay, feelings. (laughs) let's all feel good and be happy. So yeah, it's just lovely. Right. They keep it relatively positive. I mean, Mm-hmm. you don't see the bad side of it or you know like if they're ever approached in public you know when they are places you know everything is feel good it's good yeah. to be gay it's good to be queer so uh, there's that aspect which is kind of nice because mm-hmm. it's a good escapism yes you know, I agree so I feel that so anyway what about you what is your official recommendation this time around Okay, so my official recommendation is Hannah Gadsby's new Netflix special. It is called Something Special. Oh, it's so good. If I could, I would just say it's so good and end there. I suppose I technically can. It's our podcast. but That's not really how we do this. So I think one of the things that I really, really love about Hannah Gadsby's comedy is that like, yes, I find it funny. But even more than that, it is so smart and it is so expertly layered so that something will get said at the beginning that will pay off later on and not even necessarily in a callback way, although I love callbacks in comedy and, you know, they do them in this one for sure. Mm -hmm. Um, But there's just this really beautiful building of narrative that in the case of this one paid off in the perfect crescendo with the final line where I went oh my god like it was just <laughs> I love that oh, that's so clever such a pleasure so one of the things I love is that they open the show by basically flat out saying like, you know what? The last couple of specials were kind of heavy. So I'm giving you something lighter this time. And it's true. So Nanette, did you ever see any of Hannah Gadsby's specials? No, huh? I had, I was just Googling her right now. Oh, you were talking. wow. Okay. So it was like a moment in comedy when their special Nanette dropped, because I think it was just so different than anything that had ever been seen before because this show like it kind of starts with talking about like I'm well actually I can't remember if it starts that way I haven't seen it in a while but Mm -hmm. one of the things they talk about in it is saying like I'm I'm quitting comedy I don't want to do it anymore and it's like who does a comedy show saying they're quitting comedy and it starts off with like yeah there are some jokes and then it gets like quite serious and so in some ways it feels like it's part comedy like part stand-up comedy part almost like spoken word or something like that. Uh-huh. And I think some of that, like the whole thing is a comedy show, but like US comedy culture is so different than say like UK or Australia. Right, right. Their two cultures are much more similar, but like I grew up watching Evening at the Improv and some of those other, mm-hmm. like I grew up on American comedians and the occasional Canadians that would wander onto those shows. And 
it is a difficult one in certain ways because there's a lot in the in there about like narrative and narrative structure and how you think a story is about one thing but when you add one other crucial detail it turns out the story can be about something else and there is this really kind of beautiful message at the center of it that I've kind of I try to to continue to hold dear even as this idea that like self-deprecation is actually self-harm they talk about how Mm. so much of their comedy was about being fat and being a lesbian and being a fat lesbian and it's easier to do that because if you're the first one to laugh it's easier than other people laughing but that they weren't going to do that anymore they weren't going to do comedy kind of at the at the expense of their identity anymore Mm. because of this like self-deprecation is self-harm and why am I doing this I'm not doing this anymore and neither should you and then the next one was called Douglas. It was also very good. It was easier to watch. The actually, sorry, the other thing I forgot to mention is that Nanette does reference an occasion where she was beaten up and mm-hmm. references, not in detail, but references uh, sexual assault and abortion. And so it's like a very serious, difficult kind of all over the place, not all over the place, but like there are all kinds of things that were really packed in there. And Nanette, easier to watch, but still kind of serious in some ways because it's about like being diagnosed with autism as mm-hmm. an adult. And what does that look like? And that one I loved because it's just really, again, I love comedians who do things with structure. And mm-hmm. that's a great example of that where the first like five to 10 minutes of the show, they say, I'm going to tell you how the show is going to, go this isn't the show yet but of course it is the show yet it is it has begun but but they keep saying no it hasn't begun yet you will know when it begins and then there's a point at which they say and now it begins and then later on in the show we'll reference back to remember how I told you there would be a part in the show where I talk about this well now I'm talking about this and like it's just beautiful and brilliant but this one Mm. is great it's heartwarming it's fun Mm. It still has an edge to it, um, but it's about how they got married, like how they got together with their uh, partner. Uh, They met her, I think it was their first, they said like their first show, because their wife is their producer now. So you can even see it's this really cute saying like, she's over there. And then you see the camera kind of like from behind their wife. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, (laughs) like they're there. And so you hear kind of their whole, story of how they came to be together and there's other kind of things that are in there but it's really wonderful the problem though is that I am recommending a stand-up comedy show which means I can't actually really say much because (laughs) comedy is best when it's not spoiled maybe this is why I haven't recommended any stand-up comedy (laughs) shows before (laughs) um so I guess just watch it uh no for real though neil and i watched it we both loved it we found it really brilliant we delighted in there's like there's just so many on top of all those other things i said there's also like really brilliant wordplay and it's very clear that hannah gasby loves Mm wordplay and interrupting themselves to play on a word almost and it's one that like it's so finely tuned that it's almost certainly scripted but also like even if you can kind of see that like i don't care because i just love it enough so yeah if you like comedy if you like queer comedy oh man there are some great jokes in there for us <laughs> <laughs> uh, they're just like nah. it's like they know that their audience is going to be heavily queer and mm-hmm. in fact reference that like make jokes of about course, like oh yeah. you can't you can't make that kind of a joke with a mostly lesbian <laughs> audience that's not going to work and I won't tell you what it is but it's very very funny <laughs> so yeah I have to watch you... it I didn't realize like when I first looked up Hannah's name it said she so pronouns they them pronouns have changed I think okay. is okay. kind of what I had been reading so okay. um yeah like I think the first definitely when Nanette came out and maybe even when Douglas came out was using she her pronouns but okay that since changed so yeah it's so so good anybody who likes stand-up comedy and hasn't checked out hannah gabby definitely check this out and if you can honestly i would watch the three in the order in which they were released because like nanette is an experience it was one of those that like 
I have never stopped thinking about oh, wow. since I saw it years ago. It is one of the single most brilliant one person anything that I've ever seen. And then Douglas is also like, it's, it's great. And it just makes something special, just a wonderful cap off. Like you can almost, I suppose this is sort of what I do. I almost treat them like a trilogy in a way. Like there's, okay. it feels like there's this complete story that we get a happy ending to with this special, even though it's really, you know, it's comedy specials. Hopefully there's another one in a year or two. Right. And they keep coming, but I think they work really well together. So I recommend all three of them, but I am officially recommending this mm. one today. Good. That's all for the episode. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. If you've enjoyed the show again, as always, make sure you subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. You get notified when we release an episode. If you have a friend who thinks would like Queerly Recommended, please tell them all about it. If you want to support us, there's links in the show notes to our coffee and to the newsletter. If you like the newsletter, if you have feedback about it, please just hit the reply button. I would love to know what you like, what you don't like. I actually looked over the newsletter and I was super excited uh, to see that there was a second season of a show that I recommended not too long ago. I was like, Uh I'm so happy to see that on the newsletter. So good job. Or if you want to connect with us on your favorite social media sites, we have links in the show notes for that as well. Uh, Or you can search for Curly Recommended on Instagram, Facebook, Tumblr, TikTok, and Twitter. Or email us at podcast at curlyrecommended.com. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. So yeah, yeah, so I go, I told Debbie it could have been a garage sale. Oh yeah. It, it absolutely could have been anything because I because like we are trashy and we do garage sales here all the time. What's wrong with a garage sale? Um, I don't know. Debbie hates him. She fucking hates him. She's like miserable oh. from the time I said I say, hey, let's have a garage sale until the time it's it's over. I she mean, they're it. horrible to do. They are but- horrible. But I wouldn't call them trashing necessarily. You're just, you're purging and you're getting some, a little bit of money back. Yeah. But it also attracts a lot of trashy people. And then oh. like, don't come at me and want to pay a quarter for a pair of men's pants that cost $80. Like I'm already giving them to you for a dollar. Like, don't come at me for a quarter. Will you take these for a quarter? No, fuck you and your quarter. But no. <laughs> yeah, I will. When you add three other quarters. Right. To <laughs> add three more of those quarters and you can have them. <laughs> it's unreal like I literally I price things to sell and I think they're fair I'm not that person to to bargain with like I will flat out tell you no unless you price like a buck or two higher yeah but then then it's out of control then they won't like they won't try to bargain they'll be like oh she's overpriced I'm leaving a lot of people think like me like oh this is reasonable here's three dollars for this fucking sofa I mean, you know, but somebody else will be like, I'll give you a dollar. No. Yeah. In hell you will. That's the place where you'll <laughs> give me a dollar. Yeah. So I have, I have very, very strong feelings, but I'm pro garage sale. Last one, we probably got like, we usually average about 600 bucks at a garage sale. Like how, how is that not good? Whoa. Right. But there's that's awesome. Of, I know. Yeah. We don't do them. I think mostly because like, God, just the idea of staying there all day (laughs) and getting ready for it and cleaning it up. Right. But we do believe in regularly purging. We just like goodwill. Oh yeah. That's us. Like, but okay. So here's, here's, this is a fun story. Yeah. So last summer we did a garage sale and, um, a woman comes up and how did we know she was gay? Oh yeah. She said her wife. She mm. she was like buying something. She goes, Oh, my wife will really like this. And I like zoomed. I was like, wife, wife. Yeah, yeah. So family, family. Like, do you read? And so I ran inside and gave her like four books. 
okay so this is really sweet so she's like oh my god you're a writer this is great thank you and so she leaves and then she fucking comes back with a candle and a card and she's like we want to hang out we want to just like yeah it was so sweet like the sweetest people and I put her on my phone and we texted a few times and then my mom got sick and her mom was going through some cancer stuff so I mean we just never hooked back up so I might reach out to her again because she was a lot of fun she was just like a free carefree like like spirit free spirit type person I really I really liked her so did Debbie Debbie's like you know she's free spirit too that's awesome you should definitely especially now that it's like coming into summer and yeah kind of the perfect time for like a barbecue or something yeah I would be like hey do you remember me we met at a garage sale and her wife told her not to come back with a candle and a card don't (laughs) do that that's so weird they're gonna think you're weird nah it would be weird it was it would be weirder if there's like an invitation for you know swinging that would right be that would but be like weirder. a candle is just sweet, sweet. that's yeah, just a nice just gesture sweet. right and then yeah. i had to bring out all my um oh who mr candle what's the what's the thing on twitter that has all the really cool um candles with all the sayings i do not follow that account. what'd you say the gay guy candle, gay guy candle. Oh my God, that's amazing. You need to look up Gay Guy Candle. Uh, I have like a billion. This? Yeah. Happy birthday, bitch. Like they have like all these different things on their, I always get the political ones. But I, but I had, so I had to show her like all these candles that I had. Like, oh yeah. I love I Jen Stocky and. I gotta go to the. You have to go to the website. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> look at that. Cause they have some really good ones. Oh, they're from Detroit. I love that. I love that. I still like, I didn't grow up in Detroit, but I grew up right across from it. So I very click it. There it is. Yeah. I don't know. I love them, you know? (laughs) Yeah. Fuck Rhonda (laughs) Sanders. They have such great ones. Man, if they had one that said fuck Danielle Smith. They might I get it in a heartbeat. Oh, I'd probably have to ask her because, or ask them because we're uh, 